unsustainable. We're spending almost twice as much in America as any other country on Earth. We're really mortgaging the future. Not just the health of healthcare, but the health of the nation. community health center like where I work, you see chronic illness, people that aren't able to afford their medications, lots of psychiatric illnesses, but the government pays you based on how many patients you see. I think we have about 25 patients for today for Dr. Martin. I think five or six of them are on the waiting list. If they're an easy 15 minute queue, I'm sure we can probably squeeze them into the schedule. Hello, Mr. Fields. Yo soy Dr. Martin. Mucho gusto. All right, who's next? Hello, Hi. how are you? Well, first of all, my son's in the Air Force, and he's 21 on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And he's not here? Where's he at? Germany. Yeah. And yeah. you're missing him. I am. And I moved out from my boyfriend um, in December, and I work six days a week, 5.30 to 7.30, and I'm tired. Whoa. Yeah. So it sounds like you're feeling really overwhelmed right now. Sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry. Did you have anything in mind when you came in here today? I was on Celexa mm -hmm. for a while, and that seemed to help. So you were thinking about medication? If you can think of anything <laughs> else. <laughs> I'm a little bit wishy-washy on the medication because medication is not the problem. It's not. Yeah. The problem in your life is that you've got too many things going on, and you're overtired. Instead of basing things on outcomes, on how good of a job we're doing, the government sets the reimbursement completely on the number of patients that we see. It doesn't matter how complicated they are, how much time that we spend on them, it's just a number, one, two, three, four, five. You have to play this game with what does this patient need and how much time am I willing to spend with them because the administration is telling you, you need to see more patients. We're in the red. And if you try and buck the system, someone says, what can we do to get your productivity up? I'm not interested in getting my productivity up. I'm interested in helping patients. In the era of for-profit medicine, the time allowed for patient visits has shrunk to a point where you've got seven minutes with a patient. Can you feel this? Yes. Barely? Yeah. Okay. Losing the sensation in your feet is part of the progression of diabetes, okay? It could get worse. People talk about two-minute doctors. Hmm. Literally 30 patients an hour. Things could move in that direction here. And this is not the choice of the doctor. As a primary care physician, we're supposed to be the people that are making sure the patients don't get sick and that they have everything that they need to maintain health. But you end up being this revolving door. People come in and you try and fix one thing and they come back for the same thing over and over and over. You just never get to the bottom of what's causing all of these problems that they're having. Michelle. <laughs> Tell me what happened. I just tried to cut my arm open. <laughs> What were you trying to do? I just wanted to just end it. I'm tired of it. I'm so tired of it. Are you taking your medication? Yeah. A great deal of what's not in conventional medicine is to put Band-Aids on things or to suppress uh, symptoms. Have you cut yourself before? <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to cut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is Lexapro's the only thing you're on right now? This is a problem with a lot of our suppressive treatments. They may keep the disease process going, and they may strengthen it over time. It's much better to try to work at a deeper level. I'm going to make a phone call and um, try and get some wheels in motion so that we can get you the help that you need, OK? OK, so we need the crisis counselor then. Yes, this is Dr. Martin over at La Clinica. I need to speak with the crisis um, worker. There's no crisis worker at lunchtime? No, it's it. I have an acutely suicidal patient in my office that I need help with. She's still taking her Lexapro, but it's obviously not 
uh, not doing the job. Where I'm at right now, patients that are in desperate need of care. And the way that the system is set up, you can't be effective. I became a doctor because I care about patients and working here, I can't help them. <sighs> to feel that way when you come home is demoralizing. There has to be a different way of doing things. So I decided to leave. It's hard to say goodbye to the patients. I took care of them and I was responsible for them and just worrying about if somebody else is gonna do for them what they need. I wanna give to people and I wanna help people and I wasn't able to find that here. I'm gonna go look for it. The history of how the American healthcare system grew is not one of order, it's one of sort of haphazard chaos. Everybody's doing what makes sense to them individually. We pay hospitals to be full, so they try to be full. We pay doctors to see patients, so they see a lot of patients. We, we, we create a public expectation that more is better, which isn't actually true, so people seek more. It's like everybody's doing their job. We just designed the jobs wrong. Physicians are well-intentioned. Even when bad things happen, it's not because people have bad intentions. It's that our system is, is all fouled up. We spend a spectacular amount of money on healthcare. Just sheer numbers, $2.7 trillion per year. The average per capita cost of healthcare in the developed world is about $3,000. In the United States, it was around $8,000 annually. We spend one heck of a lot of money. The healthcare system isn't affordable anymore. Who pays for that? Where does that money come from? This is all coming out of our pockets. It's your money. The really astonishing part about the fact that we spend more is we have worse health outcomes. If you need real serious technology today, like a very complex cardiac surgery, you're lucky to be in this country. Rescue care is second to none. As an overall system, no, we're not anywhere near the best in the world. I mean, look at our results. Our lifespan isn't even in the top 20. We have a disease care system, and we have a very profitable disease care system. And the disease care system actually, I mean, if, if it really was honest with itself, it doesn't want you to die, and it doesn't want you to get well. It just wants you to keep coming back for your care of your chronic disease. Most of this huge effort of the healthcare industry is devoted to intervention in established disease, and the majority of that disease is lifestyle-related and preventable. I mean, to talk about how we shift toward, away from disease intervention toward disease prevention and health promotion, I mean, that, that, that requires a massive uh, rethinking about medicine and healthcare at all levels of society. It has to do with expectations of patients. It has to do with the training of physicians. It will require a huge effort. There is this tremendous innate healing capacity that we all have. When I sit with a person who's sick, always at the back of my mind is the question, you know, what is blocking healing here? What is preventing it? What can I do from outside that can facilitate that process? That perspective is missing from the training of our health professionals. What's wrong with medical education is that it simply doesn't address whole subject areas that are absolutely essential to understanding human beings, health, illness, and treatment. I mean, an obvious one is nutrition, which is almost omitted from medical education. So in 1994, I started a fellowship for people who had completed medical school to retrain physicians. We want to expose clinicians to a broader way of seeing the patient, a deeper understanding of healing, and a, a larger toolbox from which to choose for therapies. Many clinicians come here frustrated, they're overworked, they're overwhelmed, buried deep underneath insurance forms and 10 minute visits and 30 patients a day. Where are you from? I'm from Virginia. I actually practice emergency medicine Great. at the University of Virginia Good. in Charlottesville. There have been some trends in healthcare that make me um, uncomfortable. 
I felt like there's got to be something different, something better. My medical training was just focused on giving these patients pharmaceuticals or giving them expensive tests um, to treat the condition after it occurred. I had no knowledge of ways to prevent heart attack or stroke or cancer, things like that. I had to do the fellowship because it was kind of my little ray of hope of that things could be better, things can be done differently, and somebody's going to teach me how to do that, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. In Western medicine, all of our effort is on dispelling evil. If somebody has uh, an infection, we give anti-infectious agents. If somebody has hypertension, we give anti-hypertensive drugs. It's getting rid of the bad thing. We do nothing about supporting the good, that the body can and wants to be healthy. Both of these approaches are necessary, but it would be great if we had a better balance in Western medicine. The kinds of interventions that we have come to favor in this country are inherently costly because they're dependent on expensive technology, and that includes pharmaceutical drugs. I think there's some very good drugs out there. I think drug treatment has its place. Uh, I take a, a, a pharmaceutical drug myself, but if there's one thing that I would love to see you begin to implement in your own practice and teach others about, it's to try to change this mindset that has so completely taken hold in our culture on the part of both doctors and patients that drugs are the only legitimate way to treat disease. I mean, where did that idea come from? We spend $300 billion a year on pharmaceuticals. That's almost as much as the rest of the world combined. $300 billion on drugs. In the 1950s, Americans took pharmaceutical medication at about 10% of the rate that they do now. We're taught with the commercials on television, why do we need to wait? We can just take a pill right now. When I watch the networks, half the ads are for pharmaceutical agents. That isn't true in Canada. It's not true in the United Kingdom. It's not true in France and Germany. The only other country, by the way, is New Zealand. In New Zealand and the United States, only two countries in the world where you can advertise prescription drugs. What does that do? Well, it drives demand. You know, the ads always end with the same phrase, ask your doctor, and people do. And doctors wanting to please their patients will often prescribe it. Over-medicating is a huge problem in society, and the military is no exception. This is a national problem for us. You know, we're seeing the military just being a microcosm, I think, of the problems society's having. Soldiers' use of prescription drugs has tripled in the past five years. The Army says this is all linked to the rising number of soldier suicides. In fact, more soldiers died last year from non-combat injuries than during war. I could see why there's a link between opiates dependency, misuse, and suicide. I was taking 64 pills a day of combinations of Roxacet and Oxycontin. There's a contradiction in what we do. You as caregivers are told, you've got to keep me pain free. You're going to do that. And we have to be mindful to those points in time where you can intervene and say, enough's enough. We have to find the right mix of treatments for the guys. And, and the answers are not in a sack of pills. If it happened to me, it happens to a whole lot more people that are almost invisible to the system. Been shot, this deployment. Eight IEDs, just this deployment. Carry a lot of weight because I'm infantry. Um, mountains of Afghanistan are not easy to climb, so sure. compress my back. Treated for sciatic nerve, back, L2, L3, L4, L5, swelling, left side of my brain, and extreme PTSD. With 10 years of ongoing wars, the amount of suffering that's going on in the military right now is tremendous. When you go over into a war zone where you see your buddies die or you get injured, that's going to tax anybody. And we see that suffering. During the AeroVacs of wounded soldiers, the approach to pain that currently exists is to get medications. Right 
They don't say how much they gave him, but he can have anywhere between 5 and 10 milligrams of morphine. I just want to see what they, they've given him. If he's really sleepy? Yeah. It's very hard for us as nurses to treat for pain because there's no thermometer that we can stick, it, can stick in and say, oh, it's 7 out of 10 pain. We have to basically treat the patient for whatever they state. And a lot of times patients become so drowsy that they're not aware of how much they're taking. Okay. So uncomfortable. And I need a pee again. Help over here. Okay, oh, right. Wait, what? Did he try to get up without anybody knowing? No, he's trying to get him up. He just rolled himself out. He's like really not listening very well. Yeah, that's why you don't want him to fall again. Now they put him on the bottom on the other side. I'm going to check his chart real quick and find out uh, what he got at the gossip. Let me get that jacket away from him. He's like clutched his mess. Oh, here you go. This is what he's got left of the morphine. He was issued this bottle today with 20 in it and 10 are missing. He's taken 10 tablets. Away, yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, that is ridiculous. 20 he's a little is high right now. At some point, he could stop breathing if he took too much narcotic. And we're going to be doing CPR on a patient. So and at this point, we will administer the medication. Take him away from him. Do you want to do a pill count with me? We'll put it up at the front. OK. OK, so we have 10 allotted. OK, this is Prazosin. He's got Lunesta, and he also has Valium right here in the lower tab. In Proxen, he has two different, he has Percocet and he has Norco, which is Percocet. I'm not sure what is what. Uh, they're not in there? They're all, these are all name brands. Oh. The only thing we can do is separate them out because there's no way for us to tell which are which. These are all one person? But they're combined, so we don't know what they are. Dark matter is a discovery by astronomers that there is a huge amount of the universe that we can't see. It's not visible, but it's there. We know it's there. And in some ways, I think of a lot of what's happening in healthcare as kind of dark matter. It's unseen, but it's there, and it's very, very powerful. We tend to see just the light of, of healthcare. We see the goodness of healthcare, the potential for, for helping. When I was at US News and World Report, I wrote cover stories about how great the newest and greatest treatment and pill and procedure was. But in fact, the more I looked, the more I found that there's all this stuff in medicine that we don't think about that is actually harmful. When a team from Dartmouth Medical School mapped Medicare payments, it found some disconcerting differences from one part of the country to another. For example, in 2007, the average Medicare recipient in Miami tallied more than $15,000 in healthcare bills whereas a recipient in Minneapolis only cost the government about half that amount. And it wasn't because procedures were more expensive in Miami than in Minneapolis. The Dartmouth study showed that patients in places like Miami were receiving more care. More tests, more drugs, more time in the hospital, more invasive operations than patients in other parts of the country, even though the patients in Miami weren't any sicker than their neighbors. But so what, right? We want more specialists, we want more procedures, we want more tests, or at least we think we do. And that's the problem, because what we think is best for us often isn't. 
What the Dartmouth Group discovered is that the patients in the most costly regions where Medicare spent more money on patients, those patients did not have better health outcomes. And in fact, they were more likely to die. If you look at healthcare in America, you're twice as likely to get your knee replaced as you are in Western countries with the same standard of living. You're two or three times as likely to get a heart catheterization or have a stent in your coronaries. We've set up a system that often pushes physicians and hospitals and the entire healthcare system into doing more. Driven by these perverse economic incentives, we are doing a lot of procedures to people that they don't need. To a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Okay, ready? Now you want to get the scissors? Yeah. I started getting sick in my 30s. I started having really, really bad chest pain. Here we go, a flower for you. Oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> I just had been ignoring it because I thought, you know, I'm only 34 years old, I can't be having heart problems. But one evening, I sat straight up in bed with the worst chest pain. So I went into the hospital, and they told me I'd had a heart attack. I was 35 at the time and was scheduled for open heart surgery. And I thought, once I get this, I won't have the blockages anymore. You know, they'll actually fix it. Little did I know that it was followed by years of the same thing over and over and over again. A heart cath, get another stent. Heart cath, get another stent. Until my doctor said to me, I don't know what else to do for you. There's nothing else I can do. Contrary to what most people believe, Getting a stent in your coronary, if you have stable chest pain, will likely relieve your pain, but it will not help you live longer and it will not protect you from having a heart attack. It only reduces symptoms. And the problem is, is that some of those procedures will lead to bad outcomes. I started doing research about where in the United States do I have to go to get the best heart care? And ironically, it was only two hours away at the Cleveland Clinic. How are you? I am great. Look at the thinness. I know, you look really I have good. lost, look since really last year, good. I've lost 21 pounds. Oh my God. Yvonne came to see me when she was sort of at her wit's end. She had had a bypass surgery at an early age, 27 cardiac catheterizations, and well over seven stents. Deep breath. This is just an unbelievable amount of stents and cardiac caths. I'm sorry, it's gonna get pretty tight, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't tell you how shocked we were when we saw her the first time. Because here was a young woman whose diabetes was not well controlled, her cholesterol was never well controlled, and her high blood pressure was never well controlled. Were you normally for me? If someone had talked to her, I think someone had really teased out her chest pain and her shortness of breath, I think many of her cardiac catheterization and stents would not have been necessary. You, know, you have all these stents, and you know, these stents, once they go in, they never come out, and they're part of you. Now we're kind of dealing with the consequences. When you reward physicians for doing procedures instead of talking to patients, that's what they're going to do, is do procedures. The vast majority of doctors in this country are paid by a fee-for-service system. And that simply means that they get paid for each office visit. If they're surgeons, they get paid for each procedure. If it's a radiologist, they get paid for each CT scan that they deliver. If I spend five minutes with you and then put in one of these stents, I'd probably get paid $1,500. For me to spend 45 minutes on an established visit with a patient to make sure they're doing their exercise, make sure their diabetes is going okay, and to try to figure out what their true problem is, I'd probably get paid $15. It's a completely uh, irrational system. Fee for service rewards physicians for doing more. It doesn't reward them for doing a better job. It doesn't reward them for keeping their patients healthy. It rewards them for delivering more care. I was trying to figure out how much Yvonne's care would have been over the years, and I think it's well over 1.5 million. But it's more than cost. It's just so much more than money. The psychological trauma of every one of those multiple cardiac catheterizations, every time she had a chest pain, coming into the ER. And unfortunately, there are lots of Yvonne's out there.
although we've made progress technologically, you know, we know how to do things for diseases we couldn't have done before, we haven't really experienced the systemic improvement that we want, the new healthcare system that we're really after. We pay for fragments of care, a doctor visit, a hospital stay, a lab test, an ambulance trip. So because we pay for pieces, we get pieces. And so people who really need a coordinated system, they, they don't get that. Medicine is very siloed now. Medicine is very specialized. And this is really a big problem when you go to the hospital because there are so many different people who lay their hands on you. And if they're not talking to each other, you can't necessarily get the right diagnosis. You can get repeated tests. You can get things happening to you that put you in harm's way because nobody's really keeping track of you as an individual patient. A recent study found that 187,000 patients die each year from harmful care in the hospital, which includes medical errors and deadly infections. Based on these numbers, this would be the third leading cause of death in the United States, just after heart disease and cancer. Dr. Ross, I am back in the chest pain center with a pretty uh, sick patient, and I'm going to need you to call attending phone too. The emergency department is the safety net of health care. We see a lot of the chronic conditions that affect many Americans that have gone untreated for sometimes months, but sometimes years. And of course, the natural endpoint is going to be in the emergency department. Let me just take a, a listen to you. It would be so wonderful if their chronic health conditions could be prevented through effective primary care. There's a saying in healthcare policy that 20% of the patients account for 80% of the costs, and the majority of those costs are when they're repeatedly hospitalized. They're patients with heart failure, they're morbidly obese patients, they are often poor patients, but not always. One of the ways to think about saving money in healthcare is to focus our energies on that 20% of patients and think about treating those people in a more effective way. I just want to review this pain. It's right here, near, right in the center right of right your chest, chest. okay? Near. And is it still traveling it's into traveling your neck? It's traveling down my arm, my neck, and my head and ears buzzing and ringing. Okay. Time. What was it, Mr. Litton, that finally made you say, okay, that's it, I'm going to the emergency department well, now? see, I've been to the emergency department a few times before, and the last time I was having chest pain, it's not like this, it's just uh -huh. a lot worse. They sent me home with them. How long ago was that? That was, what, a month and a half ago? When I had my first heart attack, I did the cardiac catheterization, you know, put the thing up there, and then put a stent in my heart because I had a clogged artery. And that, that worked for a while. I mean, in a couple weeks, I felt like I was okay. And then all of a sudden, I started getting chest pains. So here I am going in and out of hospital to find out what's going on. Do you have any eating habits that you think I eat, No, be? I eat the regular food and stuff. What's you know, regular food? Eggs, sausage, grits, bacon. <laughs> Well, what do you think about your diet? diet? Yeah. yeah. What do you think about that? I'd do it if I had to. But, you know. If you had to? Well, you have a stint in your heart, right? Yeah. All right. And you've had heart attacks, and you're here today with chest pain. Yeah. When do you think it would be good to try it? Once I found out what's really wrong with me. We've become a culture where you drive up, you get what you want, you get it fast, you get it right away, and you drive off. And that being applied to healthcare just doesn't work. Most diseases don't happen overnight. Sometimes they're related to lifestyle habits. Sometimes it's related to what the individuals actually have access to. I have no health insurance. Sometimes I go to the hospital, and that's the only health care I ever got. I never had a personal doctor, family doctor, nothing, all my life. I stopped taking my medicine months ago, but it's too much, can't afford it. If you go out and buy a heart-healthy diet food, it's going to cost you more money than anything. Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And I think that's a good place to start. As a society, we have to make it easier and more affordable for people to make better lifestyle choices than worse ones. There's the bright blue slush. 
this is responsible for insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome and obesity and the artificial colors are not good for you. This is major reason why we see kids getting fat in this country. Let's see what we got here. One of the great contributions of America to world cuisine, you know, fake bread. We take grains and we've turned them into products like this, which rapidly raise blood sugar, uh, provoke insulin responses, cause insulin resistance, and promote weight gain in genetically susceptible people, which is most of us. Some people, this is all they eat is food of this sort. It's not whole food as nature produces it. It's completely changed food. And, um, you know, and our grandparents did not eat stuff like this. We have made all of this unhealthy food the cheapest and most available food. People eat what's cheap and what's available. McDonald's put salads on the menu, but it turns out the salad is $6, the burger is 99 cents, and if you're on a fixed income, what are you going to do for your family? These calories are cheap only when you buy them. But if you look at the overall cost to society of these cheap calories that are so junky, they're really the most expensive. It's scary how fast obesity is spreading in our country. Obesity leads to heart disease and strokes and diabetes. If trends continue through 2020, up to one-fifth of healthcare spending, or almost a trillion dollars annually, will be devoted to treating the consequences of obesity. If you want to understand how Americans are getting more and more overweight, it's because we haven't really rethought things that were put into place a long time ago when nobody really thought what the unintended consequences might be. The Department of Agriculture subsidizes all the wrong foods. We subsidize corn, we subsidize sugar, we subsidize wheat. We don't subsidize carrots, we don't subsidize celery, and we don't subsidize apples. And you can lay it at the feet of a guy named Rusty Butts. He was the Secretary of Agriculture during the Nixon administration. He was the one who thought that we should subsidize commodities because it would allow us to sell these commodities on international markets. And we've made one heck of a lot of money. The other reason we subsidize certain things is because they have very powerful lobbies. The money that's involved ends up being funneled towards Congress, and Congress doesn't want to fix it. The American healthcare system, it's generating rivers of money that are flowing into very few pockets. And those are the pockets of the manufacturers of medical devices, the big insurers, the pharmaceutical companies, and the owners of those pockets do not want anything to fundamentally change. I don't recall any time telling a lie, but I know that there were many times that I didn't disclose full information. Now, I was the company's chief spokesman. I was head of corporate communications, which means I was the top public relations officer for the company. When you're in the inner circle of a health insurance company, what's most important is meeting Wall Street's expectations. And they have to. These for-profit companies, by law, have to serve shareholders. People go in and out of health plans. They may be a member of a health plan for a year and maybe no longer. You don't necessarily make a lot of investments in, in preventive care for someone who's not going to be a part of your health plan for, for a long period of time. It just doesn't uh, work out financially. The only way that you can continue to make the profits that you are expected to make is to charge more for the policies. Insurance companies have always been able to regulate the rates they charge. They can pretty much get away with increasing the rates as much as they want to. You almost forget that what you're doing is providing health insurance. It's all about the numbers and how many millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, you're earning uh, uh, in profits. In the summer of 2007, I read about a health care expedition that was being held by Remote Area Medical, a few miles from where I grew up. I decided out of curiosity to go check this out. All these folks have driven from four and 500 miles away waiting to get care that was being provided to them free. The folks who were there were not trying to shirk their responsibilities. They couldn't get insurance. They either couldn't afford it, or many of them worked for small employers that had been purged by big insurance companies. It was either come and get care there or not get care at all. And every year, they have to turn people away. 
It was like something that I could never have imagined that I'd ever see in this country. And I knew what I was doing for a living was making it necessary for those folks to stand in line to wait for care in animal stalls and barns. I ultimately had a crisis of conscience because I was not at all proud of what I was doing. I had difficulty sleeping at night. Uh, there were even times, honestly, that I looked in the mirror and I said, how did, how did you get here? I just could not continue doing what I was doing. Good morning. Our forefathers in medicine were really about patients. It was about a passion for healing. When medicine became a business, we lost our moral compass, and I think we're, we've gotten into a great deal of trouble because of that. Since I have type 2 diabetes, I try to do what my doctor says. Managing type 2 diabetes can be hard. Adding Avandia can help. There was a drug on the market, Avandia. It got fast-tracked by the FDA, got approved very quickly. It was massively marketed. And by 2006, this drug became the largest selling diabetes drug in the world. We're talking about a three or four billion dollar a year drug. I got my blood sugar under control. You really did. Did adding a Vandia help you? I was doing a Google search, and what I found was a website in the United Kingdom where the clinical trials done with a Vandia were actually partially disclosed. And what I saw actually made me physically ill. Uh, as I looked at trial after trial, there were more heart attacks in the Avandia group. It was so consistent. You didn't have to be a statistician, or in the words of my old friend Bob Dylan, you don't have to be a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. There was obviously a problem. About a 30% increase in the risk of heart attack and related complications. And the company did nothing. They told no one. They did not tell physicians. They did not tell the FDA and they did not tell patients. Cleveland Clinic cardiologist Dr. Stephen Nissen decided to do his own review. Now, the leading cause of death in diabetes is heart disease. 70% of all the deaths in diabetes due to heart disease. Having a diabetes drug that increases the risk of heart attack by nearly one third is a public health catastrophe. And the company didn't tell anybody. A Senate investigation accuses the Food and Drug Administration of ignoring research. Finally, the FDA puts severe restrictions on the drug. You do have, you know, a lot of money at stake here. GlaxoSmithKline worked very hard to keep these numbers from the public. An FDA advisory committee started hearing evidence on whether Avandia is so unsafe it should be pulled off the market altogether. There's litigation involved and companies set aside six billion dollars to settle lawsuits. The documents are coming out in these court suits. It looks worse and worse. The independent safety officials at the FDA estimate somewhere between 50 and 200,000 deaths or heart attacks due to the drug. We're not talking about a handful of people here. This drug was the number one selling diabetes drug in the world in 2006. It's just a terrible tragedy for patients. very hard to get legislative action to improve the FDA and to better regulate the, particularly the pharmaceutical industry. There's the assumption that people who run government are, are elected officials, are members of Congress, but it's not true in many cases. The power lies with corporations and corporate interests and the lobbyists that they buy. Good morning, folks. How are you? I was almost as surprised as anybody to see the reports that I was the most frequent visitor to the White House uh, during the health reform debate. It was important to keep expressing the hospital's position. It's an expensive world to live in, in terms of uh, getting your voice heard in DC, but that's the whole function of advocacy. How powerful are lobbyists in the healthcare system? <laughs> Infinitely. What gives lobbyists power is the amount of money they have for campaign contributions. We've actually been trying to reform a healthcare system for 100 years. It goes back to Teddy Roosevelt. But these companies will do whatever it takes to make sure there are no new laws or regulations that will hinder their profits. 
I was a part of efforts going back to the Clinton administration to make sure that there was no patient's bill of rights passed because it would have expanded patients' ability to sue their insurance company or their employer if they had been denied needed coverage. So we created a front group called the Health Benefits Coalition. I'd like to welcome you to the first press conference of the Health Benefits Coalition. Corporations are very careful to choose names for these organizations to make people think that they really are grassroots organizations and they're really nothing of the kind. Part of the whole effort is to get people ultimately to vote against their own self-interest. The spin was to scare people into thinking that premiums would go up because more people would be filing frivolous lawsuits. And of course, these people had no idea that they were being made to believe this by the insurance industry. The Patients' Bill of Rights had bipartisan support. Senator John McCain and Senator Ted Kennedy were co-sponsors, but it was so opposed by the powerful insurance industry, no bill was ever passed. The health care reform bill that was enacted achieved two of the insurance industry's major objectives. It includes the mandate, the requirement that we all have to buy their coverage. Uh, that was job number one for them. Job number two was to make sure that there was not a public option. They didn't want to have a new competitor. They had to live with some of the new consumer protections in the bill. It does make it illegal for companies to just cancel someone's policy because of a pre-existing condition. What the insurance industry's objective is, is to try to weaken those consumer protections over time and to try to influence how the law is being implemented. Because of the money that's involved, getting people to do the right thing for the American people has become extremely difficult. People now, they hit the pitch we throw. If we change the pitch, they'll hit that one too. Between the healthcare we have and the healthcare we could have lies not just a gap, but a chasm. That's how big the difference is between what we could be doing and what we are doing. I think we have to recognize as a country we could have a care system that we can sustain for the long haul and it'll be far better performing than the one we have now if we get together and work on it. I don't blame anybody. They're just doing what makes sense and we have to change what makes sense. If our civilian healthcare system is smoldering and we see it's gonna catch on fire and burn pretty soon and is gonna be unsustainable because of the costs, uh, the military system is already on fire. It is a burning platform and they see this. The costs are going through the roof and the ability to help these service members and their families recover and repair and come back to a functional life is getting less and less. I was in the worst place in Afghanistan gall, the water purr, it's the most intense battleground that you can ever be in. I lost a lot of good men. Still bothers me to this day. I'm two and a half months out of combat. My very best friend from war, he was on narcotics. He overdosed, respiratory shutdown. I lost him. And from that point on, I realized that I don't want to be on this. I don't want to go down the same path. I came to Walter Reed. I was on Valium, just for the anxiety. I was on antidepressants. But I was on Trazodone, Clonopin. I was so dependent on my pain medication. This. Medications I was on. You understand? That is how many medications I was on. When you're injured, they feed you, feed you, feed you, feed you. All this stuff, it's addictive. It is so addictive. I'll whether be shot again than go through withdrawals of coming off that medicine. No soldier should have to go through this.
as we've pushed medical innovation and capability to the leading edge of the battlefield, where we can save their life. We've got some guys that have some horrific injuries, and they're getting narcotics for a longer period of time. They certainly are at risk to develop dependency, and that's what we're trying to avoid. The Army Surgeon General directed that we establish the Pain Management Task Force to take a look at alternatives to narcotics. There's very large randomized trials done at multiple centers that have demonstrated that acupuncture works. So we put together a study to see if we can actually insert this simple acupuncture technique during the Aravax of wounded soldiers into Walter Reed and other medical centers in the United States. The question was, can we relieve their pain and reduce the amount of medications that they're on so by the time they get back, they're not snowed under on multiple medications? Good Abend, welcome to Germany, and uh, welcome home. I know you're heading home, you're excited. What at first seems like strange bedfellows, healing-oriented mind-body practices and sort of the hardcore military, uh, actually is uh, an opportunity that they jumped at because of the pragmatic need in nature that the wars have driven them to respond to. There's a very, very small chance that they have an infection or any of those kind of problems. I am very skeptical about it. This idea that putting some little stick pins in your ear is going to cure pain on a nine-hour flight. It wears on your lower back wearing, you know, a 40-pound vest, and it's got to the point where the pain's radiating from my back down to my hips and then down into my thighs. And that's it. That's my little routine. First one's going in. How's your pain, sir? If, I feel like I'm warming up a little bit. Pretty impressive. Especially for it to react that quickly. When you put the acupuncture needles in the ear, you see the activity drops down. So what has happened is you have reduced the signals or the processing of the pain. When you provide a small stimulus like that, the body responds by trying to heal itself, trying to repair itself. Okay. Go ahead and bend down. That's pretty good. Any pain? Not, not when I'm doing that. Normally you would. Oh yes. I can't, haven't touched my toes in well, months. That means we're getting the needles in the right in the right place. Okay. I haven't even gotten near my toes in months. Unless I do this. Oh. You know? <laughs> years ago, we did a consensus conference at the National Institutes of Health, and we asked the question, do we have good evidence to show that acupuncture is safe and effective for any condition? They said, absolutely, it's been demonstrated that acupuncture is safe and effective, especially with post-operative and injury pain. Thank you. Appreciate it. Fifteen years later, you can't walk into your average hospital today and get acupuncture after an operation. The problem is not that it doesn't work. The problem is that we haven't figured out how to get it into the system so that we can make it widely available to the population. In the last few years, a profound change has begun in American medicine. Dr. Dean Ornish has studied and written about diet and heart disease for decades. So in medical school, I was learning how to do bypass surgery with Michael DeBakey, the heart surgeon. We'd cut people open, we'd bypass their blocked arteries, and he would tell them they were cured, and they'd go home and more often than not eat the same junk food, smoke, and not manage stress, not exercise, and then often their bypasses would clog up. So we cut them open, we bypass their bypass, sometimes multiple times. I said, there's gotta be a better way. We spend so much time in medicine mopping up the floor around the sink that's overflowing without also turning off the faucet. If we just literally or figuratively bypass the problem with angioplasties and stents or lifetimes of drugs or other kinds of interventions, then more often than not, the same problem comes back again. But what we're finding is that if we turn off the faucet, if we treat the underlying causes, which to a large degree are not so much our genes, but our lifestyle, 
that our bodies have a remarkable capacity to begin healing themselves. And these chronic diseases can not only be prevented, but even reversed much more quickly than we had once realized. When I went to medical school, I started reading all the medical literature and realized that in dogs and cats and pigs and rabbits and monkeys, you could cause them to get heart disease if you put them on a, a bad diet and ex didn't let them exercise and put them under emotional stress. But you could reverse it if you change those same things. So I thought, why should people be any different? And everybody said, that's a crazy idea. There's no way this can work. You know, what's the matter with you? Well, I've spent more than 30 years of doing these studies, showing that heart disease could be reversed by changing what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much we exercise, and how much love and support we have in our lives. In our model, the physician acts as a quarterback. And he or she assembles a team of five other people to work with. A nurse, a yoga teacher, an exercise physiologist, a registered dietitian, and a clinical psychologist. And when we work at that level, we find that people are much more likely to make these sustainable changes. And the patient learns how to empower themselves and to transform their lives. 25 years ago, I had five restaurants in San Francisco. It was a great life. I smoked six cigars a day, uh, 10 cups of coffee, a lot of wine. It was wonderful. And I had a massive heart attack. I was in the hospital for two weeks. I could hardly uh, just about walk three steps and I'd have to stop and rest. I was popping 20 or 30 nitros a day. But then Dean Ornish was starting his program to see if you can reverse heart disease through lifestyle change. And he went to my doctor and asked if he could approach me. He told Dean, how long is the program? So he said it was a year. And my doctor told him uh, he wouldn't recommend taking me because he didn't think I would live the year. So he figured I was going to die because I was in such bad shape. And now I'm 25 years later, and I'm in pretty good shape. <laughs> we found that after a year, the men who made these intensive lifestyle changes, their physical heart disease improved. It caused their blockages to become less blocked in their arteries. And that was the first study showing that heart disease was reversible. But when you're doing something that has never been done before, it's not universally accepted, to say the least. It was met with a huge amount of skepticism and resistance. People say, well, you're doing this radical intervention. You know, I say, radical? Like, compared to having your chest cut open? I mean, give me a break. We need to empower people to change their lifestyle. And if we can make it reimbursable, that really brings it into the mainstream. Now, as you know, heart and blood vessel diseases kill more Americans than virtually everything else combined. And it's treated with things like angioplasties and stents and bypass surgery. And yet, what does the evidence really show? Unless you're in the middle of having a heart attack, which 95% of people who get them are not, they don't prolong your life, they don't even prevent heart attacks. We have a model that works simply by making changes in diet and lifestyles. And in our studies for the last 32 years, we've used very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions can be. Now to a new study that shows diet may be a key tool in the fight against cancer. The study was conducted by Dr. Dean Ornish, who looked at patients with early stage prostate cancer. More than half of men over the age of 50 get a PSA test every year to try to detect prostate cancer early. It turns out lots and lots of men who had a cancer that didn't need to be treated, but they got treated anyway and it was causing a lot of harm. There's very little evidence that these conventional treatments make you live longer, but they cause many men to be impotent or incontinent or both. And so there's a subset of men who have diagnosed biopsy-proven prostate cancer who elect not to get treated conventionally. My path crossed with Dean's because we both wanted to try and bring rigorous clinical trial testing to this hypothesis that lifestyle intervention could have an important impact in men with early stage prostate cancer. I'm one of the busiest surgeons in the country. However, I don't believe every man with prostate cancer needs immediate treatments. So instead, you follow them very carefully and you treat them at the first sign of progression. If you can delay treatment, then that man is not at risk for side effects during that period of time. Hey, Liz. Hello, come on in. Dr. Peter Carroll and I collaborated with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the Nobel Prize in medicine. And she had done a study showing that stress creates shorter telomeres. So as your telomeres get shorter, your life gets shorter. Telomeres are the ends of chromosomes, and chromosomes have all our genetic information on them. When telomeres wear down and get frayed, the genetic material would get messed up. 
that prevents tissues from renewing themselves in the body and diseases take hold. I thought most things in biology go both ways. So if bad things make your telomeres shorter, maybe good things will make them longer. So we took the men with prostate cancer to see if lifestyle changes can affect gene expression and even telomeres. The research found that embracing a low-fat vegetarian diet, exercising half an hour a day, and taking part in daily stress-reducing activities can actually change the regulation of genes that are key players in cancer development and contribute to better overall survival. We found that the men who underwent lifestyle intervention, their PSA rates generally went down and they were less likely to require treatment. The program increased the telomere length. We even found that when you change your lifestyle, over 500 genes were changed. In effect, turning on the genes that prevent disease, turning off the genes that promote breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer. And even drugs, even pharma, hasn't been shown to do that. This puts the language of numbers and molecular readouts to Dean Ornish's interventions that many in the medical field, I think, feel more comfortable with. These lifestyle changes can not only work as well as drugs and surgery, but often even better at a fraction of the cost, and the only side effects are good ones. Almost one year into the fellowship, I joined this new practice. Hello, how are you? They promised me that I could make the practice whatever I wanted it to be. And if I don't want to see six patients an hour, I don't have to see six patients an hour. We're the only clinic in Skamania County. So it's about 20,000 people overall that we're the only providers for. Oh, lo siento. Lo siento. We're part of the community. All of us live here and work here. How are you today? Good. There's been a lot of change in me in that transition between La Clinica and here. I can act more as a guide for patients, taking the time to educate them and having them understand that there are choices that they have the power to make for themselves. If you have that desire to, to quit smoking, we'll get there eventually, yeah. okay? We just have to keep working towards that. And interestingly, patients really respond to that. Did you go to the diabetes yeah. education? How did, what did you think about that? It was okay, kind of gave me more idea on what to eat. And okay, all that, so. okay. You lost five pounds. Mm -hmm. I quit drinking too, so. How much were you drinking before? Mm -hmm. Six and over. A day? A day for 25 years, so. Wow, what made you decide to do that? Well, that had to be something to do with my diabetes. Mm -hmm. I'm really, really yeah. pleased. You just yeah. look different, so that's rewarding for me. I feel different. <laughs> I had to do something. Mm -hmm. Almost every study says that the doctor that has the greatest impact on your health in general, the greatest impact on the health of a population, is primary care doctors. We need primary care doctors. Yeah, your thyroid is a little bit big. Uh. What's happened today is we found ourselves in a position where we don't have enough primary care clinicians to provide that important, fundamental level of care. When was your last mammogram and pap smear? Have you? Um, 2008. Why? We have underpaid on a chronic basis, under-rewarded primary care. Some would say over-rewarded specialty and subspecialties. Okay, so first topic, Medicaid reimbursement. About three weeks ago, because of the state budget crisis, we got told with very little notice that Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement was going to be cut by about 25%. So to make up that difference, in the reimbursement rates decreasing. We're changing to shorter appointments next week. We're on track for that on Tuesday. So right now, the only way we have to make up the difference is basically to see more people. Great. That's a little, that might be a little bit of a culture shift too for the patients. And if they have a relationship with you feeling truncated, that's gonna be a little bit of a change and a little unfortunate. It's a financial necessity. That's the only reason we're making the change, mm -hmm. right? I mean, but you have to have the time to educate your patients and they don't reimburse for nutritional counseling right. or anything like that. But we're going to talk to them about it still, you know? We all know there's things we can do, and those things make us all feel good, and we like to do them, but we're going to feel really bad if our door's closed, and then we're not going to help anybody. Conventional wisdom is, over the next two years, we will likely go out of business. We're fighting everything for that not to happen, but it's because there isn't the funding going into primary care. It goes into the other areas, and it's just not sustainable. Dr. Martin has a lot more time with patients right now because she's really ramping up her schedule, but she's not covering her costs, so the rest of the physicians are covering her costs right now. 
because we're a physician owned and physician run practice, she's in charge of her own schedule. But if that reimbursement level is smaller and smaller, she's gonna have a lot less time to spend with patients so that we can at least cover our costs and stay in business. Because of the bottom line, because of the cuts that are coming through the government, if it came to the point where they couldn't pay me anymore, that would suck, but I'm not afraid because I've gotten a lot of inspiration from the fellowship a different perspective, that there's a different way of doing things that is possible. Do you have a good day today? Um, yes. yes. I would probably leave healthcare before I went back to practicing the way I practiced last year. to get off all narcotics, all medicine, everything. So just take a couple of minutes to kind of arrive. All right, so take a breath. I'm a redneck, South Louisiana boy, just whole hillbilly, you know? I don't believe in that stuff. You know, Eastern medicine, <laughs> anybody else would laugh, you know? I'd be like, what is that, boy? Hold my beard while I shoot this gator, you know? But decided to give it a shot. So we're going to open up some tea. We're gonna open up some chia. It's a good way to think of it. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's the way I like to look at it. Because of this program that's here, do yoga. I'm just gonna go ahead and put the last one in. I meditate, and it has opened up a whole new world for me. How will you leave these in for about five, seven minutes, something like that, okay? Roger that. It's wonderful. A new study finds a growing number of combat veterans are battling mental illness, but many are finding it difficult to get the help they need. Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, it's an individual's reaction to the exposures and experiences of war. War is hell. It's always hell. So you pick your spot. Soldiers know if they go to war and they get a leg blown off, your medic is going to take care of you. And the same thing needs to apply that if you have post-traumatic stress, invisible as it is, it's just as significant as a bullet wound to the, to the head or chest. The first thing I'd like to do is teach you a breathing exercise with a targeted effect on post-traumatic stress. All right, so inhale, exhale. Catching it very, very early after their exposure and allowing them to process that is so critical in the long-term recovery. Release the breath in a smooth, even stream out. OK, so let's go into our meditation practice. Meditation is scary sometimes. Sometimes when you go, go to bad places in your head. I will be at your side should anything challenging come up for you. That's a healing process because you're not bottling it up. It's going to a different section in your mind to where you can start processing it. So feel yourself there in your safe place. And remember that you can return to this place at any time during the meditation. Let go of thinking, drop back in awareness, and notice how a thought may show up, seemingly no out of nowhere, or an image may show up and then disappear. And feel yourself observing all these constantly changing sensations and thoughts and feelings. Recognize that you are this spacious, welcoming, open awareness, no matter what thought, no matter what feeling, no matter what sensation or circumstance happens to arise. Your arms heavy, your legs heavy. You're good, you're good. Mm -hmm. Done some sweat. Huh? You've done some sweat. I was on prazosin just for nightmares. Meditation takes the place of that. Notice where you are in the room, the people around. Pain, it's hard, you know? It's really hard, you gotta push through it. But this program has just inspired me to press forward. The medication depresses you, it makes you think that is all you're ever gonna be in. We'll end the practice today with the completing statements. May everyone be well. May everyone be healthy. 
May everyone be happy. If the military is able to successfully integrate acupuncture, meditation and mind body, yoga, then we'll find that the culture at large will learn how to adopt it and it will have a transformative effect on our healthcare system. Ready? The limitations of high-tech medicine have never been clear. At the same time that the power of these simple low-tech, low-cost interventions is also becoming clear. We could do a thousand studies with a million patients, it would always remain on the fringes. It's all about the Benjamins, as the rappers would say. It's all about the reimbursement. If we can change reimbursement, it's a game changer. We change medical practice and we change medical education. Trying to get Medicare to cover the heart disease program has been by far the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Most insurance companies will follow Medicare's lead. So I realize that Medicare is the Rosetta Stone. If we get Medicare to cover it, then everyone else will cover it. And if everyone covers it, then it becomes a standard of care. Well, I wanted to bring you up to date on our progress. We've been making a lot. Medicare finally is gonna cover our reversing heart disease program. That was 16 years in the making, as you know. It's not like there's one lifestyle program for heart disease, another one for diabetes, another one for changing your gene expression, another one for prostate cancer. It's essentially the same program. It's just a question of the degree that people are willing to make these changes. That, and that's the, that's the key, key point, Dean. People, so to speak, have a constitutional right to be foolish. <laughs> we, have, well, we have to respect that. But if we're really talking about true freedom of choice, they already pay for the drugs and surgery. What we also want them to pay for are for those people who are motivated and who want to change to get them the support that they need in order to be able to do that. That's probably too logical for the federal government to pick up on <laughs> immediately, but yeah. we didn't get in to this situation with so many Americans obese, with this level of juvenile diabetes by accident. We got into it because there were a whole host of policies that led us down this path uh, to sick care rather than the focus on prevention and, and wellness. Now that Medicare is gonna cover the heart disease program, the next step will be in type two diabetes. Half of Americans will be diabetic or pre-diabetic in the next 10 years, half. If we can prevent that and even reverse it, that's how we're gonna make true healthcare and not just sick care available at a time when the medical system is so, so badly broken. One company has figured out how to lower health care costs by more than 40 percent. It's an idea that's received national attention. Following the example of places like Safeway. The Safeway supermarket chain looked for a way to rein in spiraling premiums and hit on what seems to be a win-win solution. In 2005, we had a billion dollar health care bill rising at the rate of 100 million dollars a year. These are the costs of all of our drugs in order. So diabetics are the number one cost yeah. of prescriptions. You can see how many scripts in the average script. What we discovered was that 70% of healthcare costs are driven by people's behaviors. At my heaviest, I was over 200 pounds. I'd have my pizza, I'd have my comics, I'd have my DVDs, and that was the weekend. You realize one day, wow, you know, I haven't worked out, I haven't exercised, and you know, you kind of get busy, and it's just it's the last thing that you're really concerned about. I was chronically coming down with codes, and I knew that there was a history of cancer in my family, and diabetes, heart disease. I was a walking dead man. Now, as a business guy, I thought if we could influence behavior of our 200,000 person workforce, we could have a material effect on healthcare costs. The easiest starting point was in the 30,000 non-union workforce. And I believe that within four years, all of our employees will get this kind of healthcare plan. All Americans have accepted for 50 or more years in the automobile insurance industry that driving record dictates premium. And all insurance companies are saying is your behavior should drive the premium. And healthcare doesn't need to be immune to that. So we provide incentives for people to engage in healthier behavior. Our healthcare premium starts here. And if you have a body mass index less than 30, you get a discount. If they are a confirmed non-smoker, we give them a discount. If you have cholesterol under control, a discount. Blood pressure under control, a discount. And so behavior becomes a form of currency for people to accomplish their lifestyle changes. Without the financial incentives, there's no way I could have gotten to the point that I am now. It's saving literally thousands of dollars over the past few years by being healthier.
I never was a runner before I started with Safeway Running Group. Little by little, as we were here in the gym, they just kind of drafted us in, and we've been running ever since. All we did was facilitate smart choices for people and develop this culture of health and fitness. You bike to work today? Um, I did yesterday. All right. I, I did it again on Friday. All right. If you talk to the employees around here that have lost 35, 50, 60, 100 pounds, they will tell you without a doubt they have a better quality of life. For a long period of time, I was hiding. I had a full beard. I had dreads down to my waist. I was shutting down emotionally. I don't only have a second chance, I have the greatest chance, because I have a chance to make my next 50 years better than my last 50 years. It's still a struggle. When I'm running and it's a hot day and I feel like giving up, it never fails. I'll look up and I'll see a person who's overweight across the street. My first thought is, that's why I'm running, because I know what that person was like. It used to be me. We have a salmon steamer basket. Right up. You can't say you're interested in a culture of health and fitness without providing a first-class gym. You can't have a cafeteria that doesn't have calorie counts on it. Our approach here is completely holistic. Safeway's healthcare costs have remained flat compared to a 40% jump for most other companies. 30% of our smokers have quit. 21% of our obese population are no longer obese. And Safeway employees will be less of a burden on the Medicare of the future because they have adopted to this culture of health and fitness. You allow and encourage your employees to become healthier. They become more productive your company becomes more competitive. I mean, I can't think of a single negative in doing this. If I'm frustrated by anything, it's that more of the nation hasn't adopted this. Safeway Corporation, they've actually been able to bend the cost curve. Those are the kind of things that would actually have an impact. Making money and doing good in the world are not mutually exclusive. I lost about 120 pounds over the course of three years. Even if I lose 30 more pounds, which probably is my ultimate target, I'm not gonna stop doing this. My energy level is up. All my health issues have gone away. And it's nice to know that I've got a long time to spend with my family and I'm going to get to see my son grow older and you know, go to college and all that fun stuff. If we really can, public and private side, begin to migrate payment from paying for volume, paying for how much you do, to paying for outcomes, paying for how well you do, how well the patient does, that will change the game. People start to say, well, now the money is in health and well-being and safety and, and vitality, not in more, 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 more. There are answers. We know what safe care looks like. It's not just we know it. We actually can go and visit it. You can visit a hospital that stopped infections. You can visit a hospital that's ending waste slowly but doing it. You can visit systems that coordinate care nearly perfectly. The Cleveland Clinic was founded by four physicians and they realized they did better working as a team than they did as individual practitioners. And they formed a group practice. They decided that they would pay themselves a salary and the money that was left over would go back into growing the organization. And that model has continued to this day. We're all salaried, so the decision on what we do for a patient is dependent upon what the patient needs, not on our financial incentives. Six years ago, before I became CEO, I was sitting down saying, what profession am I in? Uh, and I said, well, I'm a healthcare the profession. And then I stopped to think, I've never looked after a healthy person. And maybe it would be easier to take care of people and keep them from getting sick before they actually did get sick. How are you? Hi, how are you? You know how people say it takes a village to raise a, a child? It, it takes a village to make a, an unhealthy patient healthy. It really does. She needs a follow-up with me in three months with an echo before. People with chronic disease who come in and out of hospitals, bounce in and out of ERs, that's what they need. Someone to really take an interest, hold them accountable, and then talk to them, you know, on a weekly basis. Sometimes we were talking to Ivan on a daily basis. That requires so much work, but we do it because we're committed to having her stay out of the hospital, committed to her living longer and better. You know, DVT and pulmonary emboli. We've just created a completely different system here, and the actual cost for care here is among the lowest in the country, and yet the outcomes the survival rates are at the highest levels. We don't have to spend ourselves into poverty on healthcare. We just have to do it differently. It's really easy to find articles or speeches 30 years ago in which leaders were calling for change, unsustainable costs, 
problems in outcomes and quality. But I think the economic imperatives are much stronger now. We're dealing with the health of the nation when we deal with waste in healthcare. We only give lip service to prevention, and we have to ask why as a society we are not working to prevent disease and to promote health, and how do we shift this huge enterprise of disease intervention in that direction. We need to change the nature of medicine, and I hope our new generation of health professionals will catalyze the social movement that's necessary, and enough people get aroused enough about the situation and see it for what it is, and then start some kind of grassroots movement to change the political balance of power. What I'm arguing for is not to make things tough on industry, it's to make things safe for patients, putting patients first. We have a, we have a motto in medicine, primum non nocere. In Latin it means, above all, do no harm. If I think about what healthcare could be like, it would have a lot more care in it. It would be a very different system that probably would be less high tech and more high touch. We have a lot more power over how healthy we are than we are willing to take credit for or willing to take responsibility for. And that's part of what a really great healthcare system would do. It would empower patients. It's so frustrating to know how high the risks are and how easy the answers are. The answer's among us, and only by accepting the fact that the American healthcare system is badly broken and that the status quo isn't working that is bankrupting our nation, will we be able to seek out the escape fires, the potential solutions, and create a sustainable and patient-centered system for the future?